know what that thing is? Whatever it is, it's winning. This week on At the Movies with Ebert and Roper, after months of hype and rumors, Cloverfield is finally unleashed. Oh, how very refreshing. A man who doesn't believe in marriage. Katherine Heigl wears 27 dresses. We take some, we spend it. It's like recycling. Plus, Diane Keaton, Queen Latifah, and Katie Holmes find mad money. My name is Robert Hawkins. Approximately seven hours ago, uh, something attacked the city. Um, you found this. If you're watching this, then you know more about it than I do. Our first movie is Cloverfield, a movie that's been generating buzz ever since the debut of that ingenious trailer. I'm Richard Roper. And I'm Michael Phillips of the Chicago Tribune. How you doing, Richard? Michael? Good to see Thanks you. Thanks for having me back. All right, after months of internet hype and speculation, it turns out that Cloverfield is the name of the meadow where Jane Austen wrote her best work. This is her story. I'm just kidding. I had a lot of fun with this inside out take on the monster movie. It's Blair Witch Project meets Godzilla with a handful of tension relieving laughs, a reasonably grotesque big giant monster, and a nice cast we can root for. Produced by J.J. Abrams and written by Drew Goddard from Lost, Cloverfield at first bears the stamp of director Matt Reeves, whose previous credits include a number of episodes of Felicity. What is this for? It's for Rob. Say something to him before he leaves. Rob's awesome. I'm gonna miss it. Rob, have fun in Japan. You owe me $11. How are you gonna survive without Rob? He's like your main dude. Yeah, now, hey, how am I gonna survive without you? I don't know, I'm like your main dude. All the attractive 20-somethings here look like they walk straight out of a hipster ad campaign. But they're all pretty good actors, most notably T.J. Miller as the camera-wielding HUD, Jessica Lucas as Lily, and Michael Stahl David as Rob. Now, Rob's about to take a job in Japan, and it's at his going-away party where something goes really, really wrong. Go, 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 go! Cloverfield has no soundtrack, no backstory, no subplot, no narration. We stay with this small group as something attacks Manhattan. Even with the handheld camera gimmick, I have to say the production values are pretty impressive. <laughs> Even at a brisk 84 minutes, Cloverfield comes close to wearing out its welcome. And some of the handheld shots defy the conceit of the film unless the guy ended up taping the camera to his head or his hip or something. Cloverfield, despite all the hype, isn't revolutionary, but it's almost as creative as its own marketing campaign. I had a lot of fun with this, Michael. I enjoyed it, too. So oh, good. More than good. I would have guessed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. This, and as you point out, there's no explanation about why this monster is, <laughs> you know, no. where it came from or anything. So it's not like the old movies from the 50s, say Godzilla or The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, where there's always a scientific explanation. Right. No, no, no. It's like, and I think, you, yeah, you, the you, kids don't, I don't know if the kids are going to miss that or not. You know, I got to say this too. It's, you know, New York is going through a, a, quite a siege lately because oh. you have I Am Legend and you have Cloverfield. And, you know, some of the shots in Cloverfield, especially with the smoke billowing down uh, the canyons of Manhattan, I mean, they, they definitely evoke images of 9 11. So, in, a, yeah. in, in less than a decade, we've moved past sensitivity about New York right. being destroyed and it's now used again as an entertainment. Yeah, and vehicle. in fact, that, that was my one, that was one of my reservations about oh. it because I think the way it pilfers all that 9 11 imagery. Well, that's a little queasy for me, but mm -hmm. I think the way they so selectively deal with this monster, he's just like another cranky out-of-town tourist like Jack Lemmon and the out-of-towners, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I kind of like that because a lot of times in these movies where they try to explain it, oh, it's because we've, you know, polluted the oceans yeah, and now a monster's yeah. come out. It's like, it's just a big freaking right. monster. Now, deal with and it. And you mentioned Blair Witch Project, which is clearly the visual precedent yeah, for this yeah. picture. It's also a little bit, the way it strips all that exposition out of the story, it's kind of like those last two Bourne pictures, which is also you know, the Bourne picture yeah, shot, yeah. also the Bourne ultimatum, especially shot in that crazy kind of, you know, queasy-making visual well, style. Know, this one's almost, uh, you know, a stomachache, but not that's, quite. That's, you know, Michael, that's one last point I want to make about this with the whole handheld camera thing, and mm -hmm. I know that gimmick's been done now for at least a decade. I would say this to all filmmakers who are trying to imitate amateur filmmakers, you know, just with a, you know, Sony handy yeah. camera or whatever. Most people are better than that by now. They don't really go like this all the time <laughs> right. because we've all been, you know, the average 18-year-old's been shooting home video since he was four. Yeah, right. So people are actually a little bit better about moving <laughs> the camera around. You don't have to go too crazy with the jiggle yeah. cam anymore. I would say, too, this is not an actor's movie, clearly, but I would say of the group, Lizzie Kaplan really, really stands out as somebody to watch, I think. And it's a good cast. I yeah, guess. it's a good cast. And, yeah, 84 minutes long, does the job. Entertaining. All right, there it is. It's a shame, I think, when a movie pulls together a good cast ready to make the most of a caper, and the caper itself turns out to be... Eh. Yeah.
That's mad money in a monosyllable. <laughs> Diane Keaton what? stars as the pampered Almost Kansas City housewife of the so suddenly unemployed Ted Danson. She gets a cleaning job at the Federal Reserve Bank, and in no time, she enlists the help of Queen Latifah and Katie Holmes in a scheme to scam the Fed out of stacks of used bills earmarked for destruction. Why destroy it when he can liberate it? But first, a little planning. We need a code word like, uh, uh, like liftoff. Yeah, liftoff. That comes up real easy in conversation. Right, because you don't want it to be something you could say accidentally. You know, like if our go code was hot, and I saw you and I said, hey, Nina, you look really hot today. And then you go and you start stealing money. That could be a problem. Easy as pie, the ladies switch one lousy padlock, stuff the cash in their under things, and waltz on out of there. Now I've got two reasons to live control top. <laughs> I gotta get myself some boring underpants. I know. I bet Victoria never had this particular secret. The trick, as our heroines soon learn, is to keep the spending on the down low and not give in to Mr. Greed. Jackie, there must be something that you've always wanted to do with your life. Yes, I want to see Brazil and uh, Czechoslovakia and of India and actually, Pakistan. Actually, and... there is no Czechoslovakia. What? You take whatever jokes you can find in Mad Money. Right off, the film informs you that the ladies end up getting caught, and a lot of the film is spent cross-cutting between everyone's confessions and the events leading up to them. None of it has much snap, unfortunately, and the director, Kelly Curry, who wrote Thelma and Louise, can't really figure out how to energize the comedy or play the pathos for effective reality. The actresses are ready to rip. That's the bummer here. Keaton, Latifah, and Holmes are all very easy company, but the script, based on a British television feature, takes everything too easy. So I say skip it. You know, Michael, I actually like this, and I really? didn't expect to, because when I saw the, you know, the opening credits for this, I thought, okay, we have demographic casting, and we yeah. have you know, a romp, but you have Kelly Curry, who did Thelma and Louise, wrote Thelma and Louise. And In better did, days. And yeah. also did Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood, and this is the Divine Secrets of Thelma and Louise. She's combined those two, and I right. hated Divine Secrets to the Yaya sisterhood. There were moments in this movie I thought, okay, it's very formulaic. Yet, I thought it did have some style and mm. some zip. And I really liked the performances, especially Diane Keaton, who, kind of, you know, she's been doing some strange movies lately that I've, that I've hated. Right. But in this one, I think about halfway through, we just decided, you know what? She's insane. She's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And I like that. And Ted Danson is very strong as her husband. Yeah, I thought that I, was an I, excellent performance I think, I think In Ted my Danson. case, I think, I think you're right about Keaton. I mean, she's giving it 120%. Yeah. And it's, it is fun to see her working, I think, uphill in this case. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Good try, it's true. Just, just to yeah. try to get some laugh and a little bit of truth out of this old premise. I gotta say, though, yeah. I just I just felt like every everything was far too kind of easy and felt like borrowed you pieces know, I, from old I, movies. I know what me. you're saying. It, 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 you know, it goes down so quickly and it's, yeah. you're gonna forget it. It's kind of like an airplane movie. You'll be very amused if you're yeah. stuck uh, on a flight or if you're renting it. I, I'm just saying there's just enough to recommend it. It's better than I expected it to be. It's reasonably smart. The caper, yeah, you're not gonna buy every moment of it, but kind of Clever right. and the performance is excellent, so just enough for me to I'd recommend. I'd say it. these actresses particularly deserve better. Fair enough, sir. Later in the show, Catherine Heigl yes. tries on 27 dresses. And next, Woody Allen directs Colin Farrell and Ewan McGregor in another crime caper that goes wrong. This is a way out for me, too. Well, if you do it, there's no turning back. You could kill him with a knife or a hammer. I was thinking like a mugging with a hammer. Jesus, I'm starting to think I don't know you, Ian. Look, if we do this, it, it has to be. Well, nice and clean and sanitized so we can fool ourselves about what we're doing. I'm just saying there's a line I can't cross. Woody Allen is now past 70. That means he's about 30 years past the glory days of Annie Hall and a pre-Cloverfield Manhattan. Some say he's washed up. His latest film is Cassandra's Dream, and it's a decidedly minor work, but there's still some snap in Woody's writing and still some sharpness to his black humor. Ewan McGregor plays Ian, who falls head over heels for an aspiring an actress. actress. Thank you again for coming to my aid on the road. I dreamt about you the next two nights. Being rescued is one of my wicked dreams. It's not very wicked, being rescued. It's what you did to me after. Colin Farrell plays Ian's brother Terry. They're in constant pursuit of that one big score, and opportunity knocks when their wealthy uncle Howard says he'll set them up for the rest of their lives. All they have to do is kill the man who has the goods that can put Howard in jail for life. I'm not as cool as you are, Ian. I am not cool, Terry. I, I am fighting very hard not to panic. But this is a way out for me, too. Now, you don't like playing on the small steak tables. Well, neither do I. This is a big shot for me, Terry, to make a big step up in life. It's murder. Right? I know, but... Yeah, well, don't forget it. 
Cassandra's dream teeters between film noir and black comedy. It's a morality tale in which just about everyone gets their just desserts. The ending is a bit over the top and sudden, as if Alan decided he had enough of these amoral incompetence and he was ready to move on to his next project. But I'm recommending the film for the smart script and the performances from Farrell, McGregor, and most notably the great Tom Wilkinson as Uncle Howard. Mild recommendation from me, uh, sir. I agree with you on Wilkinson, but I'll tell you, man, yeah. no, nothing in this film for me happens suddenly. <laughs> okay, I think this is a really, really plotting picture. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think in a film like Match Point, which mm -hmm. this is very much in the scheme, a of better it, film, better, I think. much better. And I think in that case, you really felt like Woody Allen was working out some new territory for himself. Okay. You know, working this kind of morality tale, but in a different setting, London instead of the usual New York. And right. I, to me, this thing really just felt like it was it was not, it was enervated in the writing, and I don't think, visually, there's nothing going on in this picture. Visually, it, it's certainly nothing, nothing special. Yeah. I, I would disagree with you, Michael, on the plotting part, because there's a lot of that sharp, quick dialogue. I think Woody sometimes likes to do, you know, going back to screwball 40s stuff, where everybody's kind of spinning their lines. I mean, you and McGregor and Colin Farrell, they don't even really try that hard with the British accent. No. It's more just about having fun with the words, but I didn't feel it plotted along. Even, even the scenes with, you know, the one guy falls in love with an actress, and the other guy's got a relationship going yeah, the on, there's some cocktail I mean, party I just, you know, banter. It's, it's, I thought all that was kind of interesting. Okay, but, okay falling in love with the neurotic, distrustworthy actress. Uh, didn't I just see that in Match Point? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's two films ago. Uh, okay? I think you've seen that in, in Woody Allen's yeah. life for about a half well, and, century. And you in know. fact, your own life. Yeah, yeah but, but thank uh, you very much, yeah, sir. Uh, but, but here's the other thing. I, I think, as you say, <laughs> the rhythm of the picture, the writing, line to line, is that sort of old, snappy attempt. But I like that. i got to say, he hasn't modulated at all for this new dramatic kind of mm, impulse. I, honestly, I think he has, and I think the actors have fun with it and like as I say you know Tom Wilkinson in particular you know, the Uncle Howard good. character so once yeah. again I don't and think we're that far apart but just enough to disagree I, I, I'm, I'm saying it's just good enough to I'm check with out. I, I think Wilkinson has the best part because it's it's that great kind of weasel that w Woody Allen clearly secretly sides with I yeah, think. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway <laughs> yeah. all right L later in the show Bono and the Edge go 3D and next Catherine Heigl stars in 27 dresses congratulations let's hit the steel Looking at movies now in theaters, I'm the only critic in America who enjoyed the bucket list. I thought The Orphanage was very scary. And Daniel Day-Lewis is getting a lot of Oscar talk, Michael Ford. There will be blood. You think he's going to win? Sure thing, and he should. And I love that crazy film. I really do. Even yes. with the problems, I love that film. It's an amazing film. piece of work. Absolutely. People there it definitely is. need to check it out. And please remember to keep checking the site over the weeks to come. In fact, it's the only place you're going to see our reviews of Diane Lane in Untraceable and Eva Longoria Parker in Over Her Dead body. All right, next movie. Last time we saw Katherine Heigl, she was having Seth Rogen's love child and knocked up. <laughs> now Heigl slips into 27 dresses. The Grey's Anatomy regular plays Jane, a slave to the needs of others. For years, she has pined for her boss, played by Edward Burns. Jane. Yeah? Did you put that breakfast burrito on my desk? I just thought you might be hungry. That's why I love you. I love you, too. Oh! Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I needed that. That's Judy Greer as Heigl's co-worker whose deadpan delivery periodically saves this picture. One night at her latest bridesmaid gig, Jane meets a cynical weddings columnist played by James Marsden, last seen as the prince in Enchanted. Don't you think it's a whole lot of ritual for something that, let's face it, it's got about a 50-50 shot of making it out of the gate. Oh, how very refreshing, a man who doesn't believe in marriage. Well, I'm just trying to point out the hypocrisy of the spectacle. Oh, that's so noble of you. Do you also go around telling small children that Santa Claus doesn't exist? Because someone needs to blow that wide open. Huh, so I wonder if opposites like sometimes Santa attract. Hmm. Jane's brat of a sister swoops into town and sweeps the Edward Burns character off his feet. On the pretense of writing about their upcoming wedding, the reporter secretly gets to work on a profile of Jane. The Eternal also ran. But come on, seriously. I mean, how much time do you spend doing this for other people? What about, what about you? You don't have any needs? No, I don't. <laughs> Someday. God knows when. Someday. It'll be my day. Now, Heigl's not the problem here. She has technique to spare and a slightly imperious but off-center appeal. I like her. I only wish she and Judy Greer could have hijacked this plot completely. Then we'd be reviewing a movie called Wisecracking Broads of 2008, not 27 Dresses. So, for me, a near miss. Not even close for me, Michael. I really couldn't stand this movie. In fact, there was there was a moment where I thought, oh, my God, is she going to try on those 27 dresses? If she In a does, montage. I was ready to jump off the balcony. Wouldn't it be something if we found a very attractive star and placed her in a vehicle where nobody else 
else seems to find her attractive, and all she cares about is finding love. And wouldn't it right. be great if she had a wisecracking friend who existed for the sole purpose of wisecracking about her friend's life? And, and yeah, then you have to sit through, instead of the song from My Best Friend's Wedding, which was, you know, Say uh, a Little Prayer, right. here we have, you know, here we have Benny and the Jets song, you know, yeah. it's kind which of which is really a song stuff. that rocks out a bar, yeah, yeah, right? Again, yeah. And here's the other thing, here's the other yeah. has talked in interviews about how she felt it knocked up, you know, uh -huh. which she, you know, which she's very good in, I yes. thought. Yeah. You know, uh, how that, how, but how uh, the premise of that picture was a little sexist from her point of view, uh, you know, kind of a guy-centric picture. And, I mean, are you telling me that 27 Dresses is actually less yeah, talk about regressive and sexist? Yeah, the women's movement back Yeah, because it's century. all about just sort of being way, waiting to be saved by your prince. Exactly. And, you know, I know there's and, an and audience the, for that stuff. And, you know, Lots. Michael, I'm going to have to pile on, but I'm going to pile on. The extras in this movie really overact, especially in some early party scenes. You watch some of these extras, and the director should have called cut and fired them. That's <laughs> how distracting they are. All right, there it is. All right, sir. Our next movie, U2 3D, opens in limited release next week. This is an early review. Now, U2 3D kind of sounds like the name of R2-D2's long-lost twin or maybe an industrial cleaner, but it's the uninspired title for an inspiring and beautifully shot 3D concert film featuring the best rock and roll band of the last quarter century, U2. And you know what? They're in 3D. Shot in South America during the Vertigo tour, this is perhaps the most technologically pristine 3D concert film ever made. This is not an in-depth documentary about the band, nor is it a custom-made show designed to show off that 3D technology. It's a concert film with only a few visual tricks. Mostly, we get to see and hear the Irish rockers as they rattle and hum their way through many of their biggest and greatest hits. It's a real-time concert performance, and I thought, it was spectacular. Yeah, I'd say it's a genuine eyeful. And I think, I don't know if this 3D approach to a concert film would actually work with a less pretentious band, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, it needs it needs sort of the, that kind of heft and reach of, the, of U2, although I don't think I agree that it's the best band of the last quarter century. I mean, The Replacements, for example. Oh, okay, okay. You know, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a group uh, I want to see. Mr. With a 3D Artsy Critic, <laughs> let's, just, let's just concentrate on U2 right, 3D. Right. But it's good. Well done. Here's the other thing. Okay. I love that's kind of wild about this picture is to see the reception in Buenos Aires. Just this, I mean, this Bono is treated like Ava Perone, essentially. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of adulation, but uh, but it all works because it, you know it's a grandiose band, and the visual treatment's grandiose, and it, it really is effective. Coming up next, a comedy of biblical proportions in our video segment. But first, here's a look at what's coming up on next week's show. Maybe I'm special. You are special. This week's video segment is brought to you by Raisinets. Make a deliciously smart choice with Raisinets. You've been playing kid your entire life, and I just joined the dad team. Looking at movies new on DVD, I didn't much care for the game plan, but it's okay for a rental for a family film. Not a fan at all of Mr. Woodcock, and I hated Good Luck Chuck with Dane Cook and Jessica Alba, one of the worst movies of 2007. However, Michael, I do have two films that I will recommend. Neither one of them really connected with audiences in theaters. First, there's The Ten, which is ten short films based on the Ten Commandments, some of them very funny, and Paul Rudd is the connecting force with all these, and I love him. And Winona Ryder's in here. She falls in love with a puppet. Correct. And Gretchen Maul falls in love with Jesus. And Jessica Alba's in here. And then The Hunting Party, which I really like, with mm -hmm. Richard Gere and Terrence Howard as these two journalists. It's sort of like a, a distant, uh, raucous uh, cousin to the third man. The whole idea of what happens after war when people are trying to figure out a way to carve out. Yeah, I'd say I really like Richard I'd Gere. I go a half that. recommendation on, uh, on The Hunting Party, but, uh, you know, but it gets points for trying, so there it is. My video pick is actually playing some theaters in the coming weeks, but most viewers can also see it from the comfort of their own home mm. through On Demand next Friday. Maybe that'll convince the average moviegoer to set aside two hours for a wrenching drama called Four Months, Three Weeks, and Two Days. Just this week, the Academy Awards nominating committee failed to give this film even a shortlist spot for the Oscar this year. It's a crock. Four months, three weeks, and two days is painful but unforgettable. They have a very twisted and very wrong-headed and very stupid way of picking films for documentaries and foreign films with the yeah. Academy. All right, The Ten is available now. The Hunting Party will be available on Tuesday. And four months, three weeks, and two days will be on demand next Friday. Check it out. We'll be back to recap this week's show right after this. Okay, recapping the movies on this week's show, neither of us like 27 Dresses. We split on Mad Money and Cassandra's Dream. I like them both. Michael did not. We're both recommending U2 3D. And the movie to see this weekend, Cloverfield.
Yeah, it is. I enjoyed that film, you know? I think some it's people a are, are going what to hate hell? it, but I yeah. think it's kind of cool that this early in the season, we already have a Buzz movie to kick around. Will the kids go for it? Do you think? I think some of the kids will go for it, and some of the kids will hate it. Okay, there you go. All right, you can go to atthemoviestv.com. In fact, it's the only place where you can get my take on this year's Golden Globes and my thoughts on what might happen with the Oscars this year. That's it for this week's show. Until next week, the balcony is closed. Blistex Complete Moisture. A rush of moisture lips can feel. And it feels great. Discover Bliss. Discover Blistex. If you think a prune is a prune, you haven't tried Sunsweet Ones. How do you like the individual wrappers? It's not dry at all. They're delicious. Sunsweet Ones. <laughs> bite for bite, even better than fresh fruit.